In chapter 23, we will be looking at amines, which if you recall from whenever you learned functional groups, maybe in chapter two, an amine is a nitrogen containing compound. The structure that you see at the top of the slide is that of capsaicin, which is the active ingredient in peppers, which sends signals to your brain that there is heat in your mouth. We also have a structure of tagaments. You see the pink pills here are different ulcer and heartburn medications. So tagament or cimetidine, is used for ulcers. That one has lots of nitrogens and a sulfur. Renitidine is also known as Zantec, which is used to treat heartburn. That one also has nitrogens. And also we have Pepsid or Famitidine, which is also used to treat ulcers. All of these have several nitrogens, which are important for the function of these drugs. And we'll look at why that is so, as well as properties, reactions, and biological activity of different nitrogen containing compounds. Amines are derived from ammonia. We can have amines that are primary, which means that they have one other bond to an R group. This is a primary amine. A nitrogen with two groups is a secondary amine. And a nitrogen with three R groups is a tertiary amine. These compounds are all over the place. There's hundreds of examples of amines found in natural products. There's actually probably thousands and hundreds of thousands if we actually were able to isolate and characterize every single one of them. We can see morphine, which is an analgesic isolated from unripe seeds of the poppy plant. There's cocaine, which comes from the coca plant. Nicotine is an addictive toxic compound found in tobacco. There's adrenaline, which is your fight or flight hormone. There's noradrenaline, which regulates your heart rate and dilates air passages and dopamine, which regulates motor skills and emotions. Some of these are tertiary amines, which are the ones on the top. Those are all tertiary. These ones here are secondary, secondary amines. And the other thing that you'll notice, at least with morphine and cocaine, is that those are bicyclic. They have multiple cycles in the structure. So you may have recalled drawing those bicyclic compounds a while ago when we were doing diels alder reactions. Amines often will act as a base or a nucleophile. That electron density allows it to function as a base, where the nitrogen lone pair can grab a hydrogen, and then it becomes protonated. So we have this protonated site here, and then the Cl, this is an HCl salt of something, and these happen to be water soluble. We also have nitrogen functioning as a nucleophile where the nitrogen lone pair can attack the methyl group and kick off the chlorine. And we form a new bond to that carbon. This is still positively charged. When we're naming amines, we name the alkyl group ending in eel followed by the word amine. So with two carbons, that becomes ethylamine. If you have an isopropyl group, that becomes isopropylamine and a cyclohexane group becomes cyclohexylamine. We can also use amino for the group as a side group instead of calling it amine um, if there's more than one functional group. That first one there is 2R4R. 4,6-dimethyl-2-heptanamine. Seven carbons was the longest chain, and the two means that there's an amine group on the second carbon of heptanamine. The next one here, we have two functional groups, so it's 4-amino-butanol, and then we have para-amino-benzoic acid because there's two groups. Benzoic acid will be the parent, and then we have the amino group. If you have different substituents on the nitrogen, we name them as substituents, like you would a methyl group on a long carbon chain. So the longest carbon chain gets the parent. This first one, it'll be hexanamine. We have N-methyl and ethyl, and we just list those in alphabetical order. S-2-2-dichloro-N-ethyl-N-methyl-3-hexanamine. So you're gonna list the Ns in alphabetical order. The dichloro are in alphabetical order as well. And then we have the other specialty groups. We have aniline, metachloroaniline, 5-ethyl-2-fluoroaniline, and then your common ones here, and these are just listed as the different groups, the ends here. So you have um, ethyl, methyl, propyl, so it's just listed in alphabetical order as ethyl methylpropylamine, 
we have diethylamine and then trimethylamine. Having hydrogen bonding increases the boiling point. Amines with less than five carbons are typically soluble in water. If you add extra nitrogens and oxygens, though, that's going to change the ratio of that. So if you remember back 225, there was the ratio of number of oxygens plus nitrogen over carbon is less than four equals water soluble. That's going to play into that as well. The boiling point of this is 42. There's no hydrogen bonding there whatsoever. If I have one nitrogen lone pair, so this is ethylamine, my boiling point is now 17 degrees Celsius. If I swap out the nitrogen for an oxygen, the boiling point goes all the way up to 78 degrees. We've got those two lone pairs versus the one here. If you have propylamine, we've added a carbon to ethylamine here, and the boiling point is 50. These are BPs. So this has room to hydrogen bond with the nitrogen lone pair and the two hydrogens. This ethylmethylamine only has one nitrogen lone pair and the one hydrogen. This drops the boiling point to 34. That's the secondary amine. With the tertiary amine, there's a lone pair, but it can't hydrogen bond to itself. So the boiling point of this one is 3 degrees Celsius. So this one is no H bonding. Amines are generally stronger bases than alcohols and ethers are, and they can be readily protonated by strong and weak acids. So putrescine and cadaverine, these are very smelly amines. As you could imagine from their, their name, those have two nitrogens. Those are good for hydrogen bonding, so their boiling points, I would imagine, are high, but I don't have those off the top of my head here. So amines do not have good smells. Rotting fish has an amine smell, so if you're smelling rotting fish, that's amines. But if you have a nucleophilic or basic nitrogen, that can grab a hydrogen from acetic acid and become protonated with this carboxylate salt here. So it can be protonated with HCl, which is your strong acid, or acetic acid, which has a pKa of around 7.6. This one happens to be 10.7. Equilibrium favors this side here. Here are other pKa's of protons that you'll see in the next couple slides here. This is not something that you need to memorize at all. This is just as a, an FYI. So all the pKa's of these are around 10 for protonated amines. And then we have the aryl amines. They become more acidic and easy to pull off. And those pKa's are around 5, except for parole. A protonated parole is very acidic. So a couple of ways that we've seen already to make amines, one of them involves the SN2 reaction of nitriles to alkyl halides, which after you reduce that gives you the amine. All right, so we've added a carbon and also reduced the amine in this reaction. If we add SOCl2 plus excess ammonia, that's going to give us an amide which can be reduced to the amine. And then benzene with nitric acid is going to give us nitrobenzene, which we can reduce with hydrogen platinum or using any of these metals with HCl followed by a base to give us aniline. We can make amines via substitution reaction. If you have ammonia and you add methyl iodide, you get CH3. That would be plus proton transfer. Then we'd have I minus here. And then you would get a primary amine. I'm going to put in theory here. Because realistically, once you form the primary amine, this reaction will keep happening with methyl iodide until you end up with the quaternary ammonium salt. So you have the M plus and the I minus, where that methyl group has now added four times. So that method is not the best one to make a primary amine, and we'll see better ideas shortly here. One other thing you can do is add sodium azide, so NaN3, to the halogen. That will give you this N3. You can reduce that with H2 platinum. 
or you can use our friend lithium aluminum hydride followed by water and that will get you the amine. We have the Rx. Our N is going to be the nucleophile, which will attack the alkyl halide. That will kick off that bond. So I now have R with N, N, N. That is minus before. This is plus. My new bond is to the nitrogen. So that is what forms after the N3. Then we add the lithium aluminum hydride. And the H from here is going to attack this nitrogen, which kind of looks like a carbonyl, and bring those electrons there. We have R, N, N. There's an H here. And these electrons are now on this one, and I still have a minus here. So we've gone and done an H minus attack on the nitrogen, it looks like a carbonyl. Those electrons got moved on to the nitrogen. And then these electron lone pairs, because nitrogen's got two here, are going to go and form the triple bond to nitrogen. And that whole N2 is now a good leaving group. It'll leave as nitrogen gas. And these electrons will go on to that nitrogen. So minus N. All right, so we've lost N2. And this is N minus until we add H2O, get a proton transfer. we get our primary amine. All right, we can also use something called the Gabriel synthesis to produce a primary amine as well. That's going to start with thalidomide. We add KOH to that, which will form the potassium thalidomide. So potassium hydroxide is going to form this N minus here. That nitrogen that is in the thalidomide, this is with K plus. That nitrogen is our amine source. So if you have thalidomide minus and we add it to an R, a halogen, we add it to a halogen here that can attack here via an SN2. And then we get an R group there. So you have your R group. Once you've made your R group, you can add acid to that. So acid, if you remember, will hydrolyze. Acid will hydrolyze your, your amides. So we would get benzoic acid. And then it, that would free the amine and protonate in the process. So this would give you NH3 plus R. So then you would need to use water or a base to remove that extra proton. If you do this under basic conditions, this NH2 will attack a carbonyl. The other one will attack a carbonyl, and in the process, it will release the amine as well. So it would be N, H, R. Right. The tricky thing to remember with the Gabriel is that the nitrogen source for your amine lies within the thalidomide. Because we're doing an SN2, the alkyl halides that will work best are primary and secondary. We can do something called reductive amination. So if you have a reducing agent present when there's an amine, we can reduce it in the same reaction to form an amine. So ketone plus ammonia. We get an imine. If you reduce that then with hydrogen over platinum, we can form the amine. So this first one here, that would be a two-step reaction, but we can do this reaction in one pot using a reagent called sodium cyanoborohydride, which is similar to sodium borohydride, but this makes it more selective for amines. So we add ammonia with sodium cyanoborohydride, this will first form the imine, and then in the same reaction, then we'll get the amine that forms. So this would be an intermediate, so that's your primary amine. 
You can do secondary amines just using a primary amine. So you get N, R, H. And then to make a tertiary amine, you need a secondary amine. All right, so for your synthetic strategies for amines, you can start with potassium thalidomide. You'd have to make that first using thalidomide plus KOH. Add to that, preferentially, a primary alkyl halide. Follow that up with NH2NH2. That will get you the primary amine. You can use the sodium azide synthesis or use ammonia with reductive amination. So we can see these different things come into play here. Once you form a primary amine, you can do reductive amination with something else to form a secondary amine, and then do a tertiary amine, and then you can alkylate doing quaternary ammonium ions. We can acylate amines. And this we've already seen as a reaction in which we form an amide, but the nitrogen will attack the acid chloride and we get HCl as a byproduct. So this is acylating an amine, or you've seen this acid chloride reaction. And for this reaction, we usually use two equivalents of the amine. All right, and then aniline plus Br to excess will give us a whole bunch of bromines that are ortho and para. This is very activated. So if you recall, Friedel-Craft acylations did not work very well with electron donating groups and electron withdrawing groups. If you wanted to do a Friedel-Craft reaction with aniline, you could do it by deactivating the nitrogen via an acyl group. So instead of doing the friedel craft uh, without the AlCl3, we're just going to isolate that and get this one. Now if we add Br2, that's just going to add one Br. And then you can use NaOH or H+. Plus in order to remove the acetyl group. Likewise, now you can do a friedel craft if you wanted to. And that would add para. All right, so I jumped the gun on that one. If you try to do the friedel craft with aniline, the AlCl3 is going to deactivate itself on the nitrogen. But if you do this reaction here, which I've drawn pretty on the last slide, we acylate. Let's say I add a CH3Cl. That nitrogen is still an ortho para director because it is electron donating, because it's got lone pairs on that nitrogen. So that'll add para, and then we're going to remove that acetyl group with acid or base, and then we can do Friedel crafts. Nitrogen is a bad leaving group. If we add excess methyl iodide to that, this makes it a great leaving group. So nitrogen, we said amines, NH2 is a bad leaving group. If we methylate it and make it into the quaternary salt, that's a great leaving group. I add silver oxide, water plus heat, that is going to eliminate the leaving group. So if I had, this is a different compound now. All right, so once we have this alkylated nitrogen, if we use a small base, NaOH, even with E2. Normally we would expect to see the most substituted alkene form, 
but unexpectedly the less substituted less stable one is observed. So we can do that reaction and get this less substituted. It's kind of like using T butoxide, but here it's the leaving group that makes it go to the less substituted alkene. Likewise, Ag2O, H2O and heat would give you that same product. So if we have this phenyl and phenyl compound here, we add excess CH3I, which will make it that good leaving group. And then we're going to get the less substituted alkene there.